Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff and my wonderful co-host, Cindy Vickers. And we're here at Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. We have a very, very special guest today, Dr. Ava Frick. And Dr. Ava Frick is a veterinarian who has bent the rules and moved out and expanded the service out of traditional medicine. And she owns a clinic called Pet Rehab and Pain Clinic in Eureka, Missouri, right off of Highway 40. And is that the 109 exit? Yeah, I-44 and 109. I-44. Mm-hmm. So you want to say hi? I do. And <laughs> thank you, Dr. Doug, for inviting me to be here. No problem. So uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, her non-traditional medicine is becoming more traditional. So I'm going to let you define what you do. How you, Someone says, what is your practice about? Can you define some of the terms that best describe it? Yeah, I think in the broad spectrum, what we call it is like animal rehab. We're looking at physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. We know we can't use the word physical therapy because that belongs to the PTs. But in animal rehab, there's a lot of aspects to that. Number one, for my practice, is chiropractic. Mm -hmm. is really being able to get the body back in motion, get those joints moving to help that animal feel better. But along with that comes like specific exercise programs, looking at the biomechanics of that body and what that animal is needed for or what it wants to do, what the owners want to do. And I'm talking about not just dogs here, but we're talking horses, mm-hmm. work on cows, cattle roping steers. Oh. Uh, yeah, just all kinds and birds and guinea pigs and rabbits. You know, some of them is just to hop around and look pretty and be happy. And other ones, they got performance. So it's not always um, proactive. Are you being proactive in the sense of some of this, like the exercise programs, you're not necessarily treating a condition, but you're preventing a condition with through some of your programs. It, and on the other end, you're treating something. Exactly. Okay. Right. You can come at it from both ends. And a lot of times as an owner becomes educated on one animal, then the next one they go, okay, we don't want to get to where we were before. Let's do this one different. More preventatively. Yes, certainly. Yeah. And a big part of that is nutrition. Mm. There's so much about the body. I mean, really, if you think about even veterinary medicine 100, 200 years ago, it was all about nutrition. Mm -hmm. It was the nutrients. What's in the ground? Why is this disease popping up? Why does this animal have a skin problem? And, of course, mostly it was livestock. We weren't looking at domestic animals so much in the 1800s and early 1900s. But still, how did you correct something? How did you diagnose a problem? It's like looking at the food, what are they eating or what's missing? And so when we talk to a body, when you look at the body, what is its priority? It's making those cells work. What makes the cells work? Vitamins and minerals, nutrients. Amino acids. So, as those are missing and missing and deficient and adulterated, that body becomes Messed adulterated, up. Yeah. and then and then down the line it becomes a disease. Mm-hmm. But but it really started as something not there, or if we look at like toxic metals, too much of something, something. that shouldn't have been there, right. which got there probably because what the body really needed wasn't available, and so the body will put a square peg in a round hole because at least it gets it down the road. Well, that's a good question that uh, I was thinking about. Um, Let me just ask this, Cindy. Uh, So I always felt like with equine, some of the things we make equine do are not natural history normal. And so is there any issue about that? Do you talk to educate your people? I mean, a jumper is a jumper. You're not going to be able to change that. Uh, but, you know, some of the gates that we force them to do and go backwards. I mean, these are things that horses don't typically do. So aren't we, by by our, our um, I guess, our science or our, our hobbies, our interests, mm-hmm. we are challenging some of these animals and, and maybe hurting them unnecessarily. I don't know. Well, I agree with that, that sometimes when I'm working like with a horse, as that example is perfect, is that sometimes what the owner wants to do or their goal may not be either one, something that physically and mechanically that horse can do. Mm -hmm. It may be because structural conformation is not exactly what that sport requires. And even though they love this horse, it may not be able to excel to the degree that person wants to do. And sometimes it's the mental state. Like, not every horse thinks running barrels is a good time. Right. Or not every horse is going to think uh, going racing around and around is a good thing. Or another one may not think that, like my one horse, uh, 
he didn't really enjoy dressage because it was like so concentrated. You had to like, yes, and you had to just be so perfect. And when we got to the jumping part, now then he was happy, but the rest of the time he was moaning and groaning. That wasn't his game. So you gotta, if you wanna have a fun team, and really as horse and rider, you really are a team, you gotta make sure that both parts and everybody's minds and it's all working together. So it's a breed specific kind of thing too in part Mm -hmm. and the relationship i guess for a given breed like Mm -hmm. they talk about warm bloods and cold bloods and their person their purpose in the industry um so that all has evolved i guess over a relationship so i would think just in relation to that if you're if you're speaking specifically like you're asking a horse to um have their gait be a certain way so something where they're like like high stepping with their feet and or or crossing their legs and going sideways Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm thinking that if, if uh, structurally or conformationally they're quite able to do it, then it just really probably um, can't be harmful unless your method of teaching is just devastating to the animal. So if they're, if it, you know, if it, it's like a training, I think anything, if it's something that is interesting and it keeps them interested and, um, there's a sense of accomplishment, which I actually think animals are aware of when they learn something new and they can do it, and you know it's kind of a, a great thing. Um, but you, it's hard. It, it it's going to all come back to this sort of holistic way of looking at what you're doing. I mean, is it does it work uh, structurally? Are you teaching in a way that is appropriate and that your animal, in a way, is capable of learning without? Um, really challenging what it can do or what it, well yeah but yeah. that can be a, a really that can be an actually i think that can be a great thing and a fun thing or it can be a horrible thing just depends upon your your ability to know how to communicate with an animal and um and keep it interesting and keep it you know relatively fun you know i haven't mentioned the term that you brought up holistic i don't think i mentioned it maybe i did right at the beginning but you haven't used it and um you talk about physiotherapy, chiropractic components, and all these other things. Is holistic kind of an umbrella uh, term for you, or is it something you don't think is appropriate to use? I I I think it's fine. And that's a word I think that industry, some industry, came up with to try to describe or pigeonhole or set a group apart from another and that you're this and you're not. I think there's many traditional vets that from their perspective really are focusing holistically from their perspective. Mm -hmm. It may not match what my perspective of that term was. And so it's a little bit vague. It's like, what do you think it means or what is your definition of that? So I just describe what I do and then leave it at that. Call it what you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, whatever it means. I want to tell you just one little story about nutrition. So I'm not in any way assuming that this is a control study or this means that it always works or anything. But... But I worked with the dog for a long time. It was a it was a hundred and fifty pound Malamute. So so thirty of those pounds were unnecessary. Um, I didn't feed the dog. That's what I say when I look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but every year, without fail, this dog would be um, at their vet with these hot spots that were just big and gooey and oozing. And every year, it would go through this whole steroid treatment and all this cortisone stuff and. Um, you know, and fi- you know, and so it took me quite a while to talk to the owner. And said, "Listen, here's what I would love you to at least try because it didn't really work. I mean, it, it was like a little band aid on it, it's putting it out this, the fire, but not right. but didn't not, find the arsonist. Not a, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I said, would you just please change this dog's food and stop every single treat that you give it? Because if you looked at the ingredients on the treat, it was just chemicals and dyes and things like that, and the and it was, it, in my opinion, not the greatest." dog food and I'd like to talk to you about that. And so they did and that dog did not get hot spots anymore. And I, she was ca- I actually groomed her so she uh-huh. stayed really well groomed, but the thing that was the big big change was the diet and and this I mean she had them for 6 years mm-hmm. every single year. And then they changed their diet and the hot spots went away. And I've told that to quite a few people after that and they had similar results. So again, I'm not saying four dogs is a control study, but it's it, it I think makes that's you an ex- think. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. an accepted principle even in human medicine, you know, for whatever we end up showing in disease, like you said, is going to either become um, because we've 
um, abused our body with the pro- improper nutrition over so many years. We have some genetic influence. And then, of course, we've got toxins everywhere in our environment. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I think that's pretty normal. And you just mentioned the genetic influence, too. When we look at, like you said, that's a Malamute. So like Malamutes and the Huskies, those dogs have a little bit of a different MO because they're really closer to the wild than if you said a miniature poodle. You know, there's a big difference between how long those dogs have been on their own and living off of nature, which is going to be a whole rabbit, a whole bird, maybe they found a mouse. You know, they're eating the whole body parts, sure. basically raw type diets. And we want to, when we're well, looking at... That's how at I raise my kids, by the way. They're on raw? Out in the raw rabbits oh. and stuff. Well, hunting for the themselves. Yard. Whatever it was, they had a fence. Grab a root and growl. <laughs> that's right. I'm sorry to mean that. That's okay. Um, but also, it, we want to look at where did this breed come from and what did it live off of for thousands of years before it came to America. Right. So if you're treating a Shih Tzu, you want to look at, you know, there's going to be a lot of fish in their diet. You know, mm-hmm. they would they would have eaten some rice. They're going to eat the kind of vegetables of where they came from. These, like, exotic breeds that are coming in from Africa, they're like, they've only been here, like, less than, what, 20 years. And a lot of these dogs are put on the same kind of dry food, corn base, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some protein, but not enough, not all of the 18 amino acids, only maybe chicken. That's the main thing that's in a lot of the foods. And so those dogs become deficient really quickly. You look at Egyptian dogs, they eat dates and nuts. And so when we're trying to put these bodies back, it's like go find out what they were raised on for thousands of years that made them be healthy. That and makes then so much mimic sense. that diet. Yeah, we don't well, think is that about like that. the Exotaka Kokolangan, that dog? What is that dog that starts with an X? I can't the even... cotton? What? The no, one that they the call the cotton? Kitan? Yeah. Kitan. No, 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 no. Oh. The Kitan du Tulier, no. This, the one that starts with the S is like X-O-L-Y-C-H-U-N. I thought that was a... Um, um Something like a. It's uh, either an African or Egyptian dog, oh, I'm okay. pretty sure. And yeah. I, it's very sleek. And anyway, well, it just has a name. I'm, I, I've never heard anybody pronounce it. So well, that makes hoping lot, that at, makes in, the, in sense. the room, one of the three of us would know. But <laughs> no. no not gonna <laughs> well, we just may not know your, your hint is horrible, maybe. It, I mean, I'm maybe it's it your up. fault. Okay. <laughs> How comes the phone? Let's check. Yeah. Okay, carry on while I Google this. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. So I want to ask you. Um, Ava, if you can tell us a little bit more about um, the definition of some of these aspects of your practice, physiotherapy and what tools do you use, or chiropractic, mm-hmm. what tools do you use, and what can people expect um, when they come to your clinic in terms of the um, how you do your assessment and all that? Because obviously you have to do a lot more of an assessment than the average veterinarian does. We get so fast through our exam, and did you, we do our service, and we're out of there. But yours is a much different process. Yeah, and I do understand from both aspects, because I did traditional medicine solely from 1980 when I graduated through 1997, and that's when I got certified in chiropractic and then started morphing. And by 2001, I've been doing just strictly all of this. And so you're right. That was one of the things. Number one is we have to allow much longer time per visit because there's a lot of history to pull out, Mm -hmm. a lot of information about what's been going on, and then just like a gait analysis and assessing the body from a different perspective. It's more like specific every single vertebra and every single joint when we're looking at chiropractic. And so about chiropractic is equal motion from left to right. The body should be able to flow. There should be... When we look at posture, there's certain posture types that fit different breeds, and that should be there. How they stand, their conformation, not like not everybody's going to be perfect conformation because we have mixed breeds too, but they should stand um, equilateral. Uh We shouldn't have their rear legs standing underneath them because that's going to, they turn into the old man and they just start scooting and their back becomes very arched and that's very uncomfortable and their quads get tight. So all of that is part of it. So that's that part, and then doing the nutrition, I do that. And for ones that do have tissue problems and injuries, then we would get into doing physiotherapy. So that's going to be some kind of a device, Mm -hmm. whether it's a microcurrent or it's laser or ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasound, we do that. Um, There's Qigong, and then we have the underwater treadmill. Mm -hmm. We have a land treadmill. I have the pulse signal therapy. 
Yeah, it could have been a guy. Every tool or toy there is, I've got it. <laughs> Do you know how to fix all those things? And... Oh, well, now, you know, I am pretty good about some of them. You have to you have to be able to, yeah, work with some of that and repair it yourself. Otherwise, yes, you're always calling you know, somebody in. When I was uh, 13, I got a Yellow Pages for my birthday, and I figured that's what I was supposed to do. If I had a problem, call the Yellow Pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. Okay, here's the spelling. It's also called a burble. It's like a, it's excuse a, me. A burble. It's like a me, it's oh, I a, thought you a burped. I'm sorry. This is the spelling: X O L O I T Z C U I N T L I. I would never have gotten I, that. Well, that's what. Yeah. And, and where is it from? Africa. Oh my God. So it's probably actually it's probably the spelling of the actual term, whether it's Swahili or something else. That's probably where it's coming from. That's what you think. I'm thinking it's, it doesn't sound like any English I ever learned. <laughs> so we're going to stop for just a moment. We're going to come back. This is really wonderful. Appreciate you coming in, Ava. And we'll take a quick break. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff, Cindy Vickers, and Dr. Ava Frick. And we're here at Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. We'll be back in just a moment and continue our interesting discussion. Well, we're back, gang. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff, Cindy Vickers, and our guest, Dr. Ava Frick, again from the Pet Rehab and Pain Clinic in Eureka, Missouri. Ava's been kind of educating us to the aspects of her practice, which is non-traditional and yet becoming much more accepted and traditional. I know for a fact in our veterinary clinic, we share clients with Ava, so they like certain things we do, they like certain things that she offers, and then collectively we try and uh, get to the problem and solve it together, and it's been a good relationship. So I have, um, I'd love to know your thoughts on this, because I have a little um, puppy client, I've been training dogs for a long, long time, 25 years, and, um, but who's My coming? client uh, got a little golden retriever puppy, and um, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to train this dog to be a service dog for her. And so we had had um, one meeting, and then she called me. He was because he was a baby, and he got his vaccinations and almost died. So ill. So now, still three weeks later, he's not strong enough. To actually have a lesson, he's much better. But he was—he could not even stand up. Wow. He would just lie there and. Um, what, what was the particular breed? Did you say golden retriever? Golden retriever. Okay. And um, they've had, you know, a few goldens in the past, and mm-hmm. um, it just. So I know that it's a controversy. It's the same thing with people, mm-hmm. and I'm realizing that most dogs don't have a horrible reaction. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on vaccinations, yes. immunizations. Yeah, it's a big. It's a, it is a, a big consideration. So for that little guy, there are actually some homeopathic preparations, and when you use the right homeopath, it can really make a huge difference. But to help him overcome that really bad reaction and get his body going, so you know you can have that autoimmune antibody reaction that happens in the tissue for that particular one, and you don't know whether or not it was something in the composition of the vaccine or if it was the virons themselves. So you never know when that's gonna come up. But if he was just starting, so what we do is titers. We'll titer the dogs and find out. That's what I recommend. There's a lot of veterinarians now that do titers that didn't used to because it's been so researched by some really prominent, like Dr. Gene Dodds, is a very prominent veterinarian in California. It's done a lot of research in that area and uh, really with rabies. She's done a lot of work lately with rabies. And so you can actually take a blood sample and, and after they have been vaccinated and you would find then what their protective level Level is because if they have a certain level of protection then you don't want to keep putting more virons in there right. yeah it's kind of like okay you build your your navy and the army and the air force and the marines and then you have your seals and all your special divisions and you keep making more and more and more soldiers if you don't have a war to go to what are they going to do they've been trained to fight eventually they fight amongst themselves so that's <laughs> what happens in the body it starts attacking itself yeah. And it can attack any type of tissue. It can attack joints. It can attack the red cells. It could attack the kidney, the eyes, the skin, lupus. You know, all of those yeah. autoimmune conditions. We like to, so, yeah, we like to teach um, uh, Cindy a new word every time. So, uh, can we? Not just me. It's for the audience. It's for the audience. True, but I, you always I, get excited. When yes, we, but I, I have mostly known what the words were. But if uh, I hear one I don't know, I really love that. 
Well, you can you skin. define homeopathic for us? I and mean, we all know kind of what mm-hmm. it is, but can you break down the word and explain? Uh, so the homeopathic field is, I mean, it's been along hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years too, but it looks at, it's, it's an approach of taking a frequency of something that's a problem and you introduce another similar frequency of something that's like it, only they're mirror images. And when the two collide, it flattens it out. So if you had like poison ivy, you might take a homeopath that was a prickly something, I mean, what stimulates the itch, but it's again reversed to that, and when it goes in the body, it flatlines that problem. It neutralizes so, it or in some flat way? Flatlines it. It's yeah. a, the frequencies hit and then they flatline each other. Okay. Everything in life really is about frequencies. That's how this radio station works. That's how our cell phones work. You know, used to you had to take a key and put it in a car. Now you got your little zapper and you can, you can be drunk and find out where you are across the parking lot by pushing the little button and the lights bleep for you. <laughs> yeah, where right, did I leave right. that car? I believe it may have yeah. happened. It's so, <laughs> <two. laughs> <laughs> so everything really is, is frequencies. Everything exists. Every You know, a thought that you have is a frequency. An emotion you is a frequency. You mean an electrochemical kind of reaction, or is that what you mean Frequencies. by frequency? Frequencies. Like how many vibrations of something happens per unit of time gotcha. is a frequency. They're okay. measured in hertz. So when we look at frequencies across the far line, you have like far infrared rays, and you have the infrared rays, and you have the radio band waves, and you have the microwave band waves, and then you have the area where, and you can look this up, it's in the encyclopedia or whatever, you Google them now, you can find it, and then there's gonna be a frequency zone where mammals exist, and then you're gonna get into the frequency zone where like amphibians would be, and then you move on down and you get into the frequencies where parasites live, and then where bacteria live, and then where viruses live. So when you're healthy, you're, you're vibrating up in here but as you become weak your immune system you're the toxins you wear down you move down you get into that zone where a parasite can live in you a bacteria can you a virus can invade (laughs) and so we're working always at building that frequency so back to this about doing the antibodies we're looking at this protective level oh we were talking about homeopathic then so that's how homeopaths work so So you're trying to put something in there that's going to like you said, neutralize, but it's going to flatline that problem. Does mm-hmm. this, in fact, get into the area of quantum physics? Yes, yeah. certainly. So yes. Uh-huh. when you talk about people who are um, uh, spiritual masters, this conversation will come up, actually. This is a conversation like I, you know, I'm really into yoga, and one of my favorite books ever is Autobiography of a Yogi, and, and there's a lot of... Um, Yogi Bear? No, oh. it's devoted to this, but you know, where these people really are elevated to a much extremely high spiritual level where they mm. live for many, many, many years and they can move from one place to another. And it's because of the frequency that they operate at. And um, so I, this is fascinating to me. And, I, and I've done uh, quite a bit of energy work and with horses and, and dogs and, and I don't know how it happens. Somebody said, would you show it to me one time? I said, well, <laughs> I'll show you what <laughs> so I do. Show, but it's you invisible. Can, you can't see anything, but mm-hmm. but I I think but that you can also, uh, you know, you can increase your frequency, right? There's, you can, you can increase your, that your vibrational mm-hmm. level. Is that? Does and this get into a, Reiki? And so, the same thing? yeah, that would be one of those yeah. kinds of things too. But when we look at, if you look at frequency um, of the body, Basically, if we were doing like an EEG of the brain, you're going to have the alpha, the beta, the gamma, the delta, the theta. Those are the five frequency wave bands that they measure in a body. And so the alpha is that very relaxed state where you don't have any pain, where everything seems good, where you're happy, where you're, that's the alpha state. So you're looking at that frequency that helps you to vibrate there. Now, when we look at individuals, You know, not everybody likes classical music. Not everybody likes country western music. Not everybody likes hard rock. Those are all different frequencies. And so some bodies feel like they vibrate better at one frequency than another, but it's all resonating. So you, just like the tuning fork, you know, the two tuning forks get close and the other one starts vibrating. Well, that's how it is in any relationship between an owner and a dog, the rider and the horse. If you're at a good frequency and you're calm and you're relaxed, then that horse is gonna feel that. 
If you're a little bit wagged out, well, they can tell as soon as you take the lead rope. You know, not every person has that composure, or like you were talking about the shamans, the shamans, or the, you know, the, the just yeah, the, the, pe- pe- the people who are elevated spiritually. Yeah, so. n- not everybody can get there because of whatever considerations and things that they have that cause them to, to not vibrate that way. But everything we really do, every medication vibrates on a frequency. Every food is going to be of a frequency. And what we try to do at the clinic is put the right frequencies that builds the frequency in that body. So we're enabling that body and that little spiritual being, that creature there, that spirit, to be able to live as fully and wholly that they want to. Now they're just like with people. There's some who don't want to be well. There's some people who don't ever want to be happy. There's some dogs that are just mean dogs, and there's some dogs that are always happy dogs, no matter how sick they are. And those are the ones you feel the worst the for <laughs> when they get sick or they have something because they're just so sweet and happy and nice. And oh, dang, why couldn't it be that really ugly mean dog I saw yesterday <laughs> instead of you today? You know? So I, so I think what you just said about the brain, where that is, uh, I, most people have heard of the fact of, you know, like alpha waves and theta waves and mm-hmm. beta waves, and, and, it, and don't question that that exists. So I think if sometimes for people who are wondering, well, this, what is this conversation she's having? This, isn't, this sounds, it's crazy talk. If you can just you know, come back to this idea that you realize that scientists and doctors, that it's very normal and accepted practice to be measuring brain mm-hmm. waves and frequencies. This is not at all a ridiculous theory. And people do this every day when they text a message, when they take a photo on their cell phone and press send, when they film something and send it in the airwaves. Where does that go? You push that send button. You can even do it in elevators now. You can you can take a photo, take a video, press a send button. It goes to somebody in seconds. And they're looking at the very, they don't even get mixed up. You don't get this donkey on the top and yeah. some car on the bottom. You get the picture. Isn't I that know. amazing? Gazillions of these amazing. going through the air all the time. How does that work? Yeah. It's all about frequencies and waveforms. People do it every day. They just don't think about it in the food they eat, in the water they drink, in the well, you're furniture saying they're sitting Everything on. has an energy yeah. form of exactly. Some sort. I, everything. I believe that. Water. Yeah. yeah. Better and water, I, worse water. So unless science develops um, whatever their process is to come to grips with this decision or that decision, it's not accepted until, you know, by some, until there's a certain process that's followed. And others are more willing to kind of reach out and explore opportunities. I was Reiki trained. They did it for animals. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that I had some very positive experiences. But... Um, you know, if I talk to people, they might think I'm a little bit kooky, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, so I am a little kooky. <laughs> so that's a very interesting topic. But again, I think we're going to go ahead and take another break, and we'll be right back. Continue going. Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show with Dr. Ava Frick, our guest, and my wonderful co-host Cindy Vickers, who, since she started dating this new guy, has looked very fresh and healthy and happy. Well, so, thank you. I feel kind of like a rag today, but okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I needed a little boost today. <laughs> and myself, Dr. Doug Pentecost. So we'll be back in just a moment. Here we go again, and we're into our third segment of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And we've uh, Cindy and I have been talking with Dr. Ava Frick of the Pet Rehab and Pain Clinic in Eureka, Missouri, and she's kind of defining what she's created as a uh, a less than traditional uh, practice uh, for veterinary medicine and helping animals of all types, big and small, horses down to little puppies and stuff. And um, it's been really, really interesting. Uh, did you have another question? You I have to actually have two questions. And okay. um, I, I also just think that it, it, to be careful when somebody is described as, well, less than traditional, that her background and training and probably original practice was the same as every other traditional vet, and then she just grew it from there. So I would sort of a shout out from me to you. About Thank that. you. Um, but there's two things I wanted to ask you about, and I'll ask the first, I'll just tell you what they are because the nutrition one's gonna probably take more time. But are you using much um, hydrotherapy 
with your dogs? Is that like something, or not dogs, with your animals? Because you probably it's mostly know dogs. Gene Gieselman, I think. Yeah. That, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we work together. Yeah, and because mm-hmm. um, he was really interested in doing that for a while, and mm-hmm. I think it works best probably in your clinic. But do you use it? What do you use it for? Is it like swimming for people when the joints can take pounding? My doggy just did it there. <laughs> Bruno, he yeah. had his time in the water tank. Yeah, Bruno. Uh, for me, it was a, a wonderful opportunity for a rehab, and I had read some traditional articles saying that if you put rehab post a surgery and my doggy had a surgery called a hemilaminectomy which is that's when they open up and take the uh, disc that it's moved out of space and put pressure on the spinal cord or the peripheral nerves coming out of the cord and they remove that because it's causing damage and making the dog uh, paralyzed or sick or weak or whatever and uh, so we took our dog to Ava and she instructed some different structure not only the uh, water therapy but mm-hmm. you also did the electrical we did alpha stem microcurrent alpha stem. Mm-hmm. yeah can you explain that a little bit too? i would like to so uh, in the late 90s after i'd gotten certified in chiropractic i was looking for what could else could i do for pain in animals because we had like uh phenylbutazone we're still using we had prednisone and remedil had just came out but really that was all that was there as anti-inflammatories um, and so I was looking, I did go to the human field. So I was going to physical therapy conventions and American Academy of Pain Management, trying to find out what do they know for people that I could apply to animals. Morphing. <laughs> Later, I guess. So, uh, yeah, things with tools with your hands. Because, you know, I wasn't doing surgery anymore, so I had to have my instruments. Right. So uh, going to these pain lectures, and this alpha stem came up a couple different times, so I went looking for them and I bought five of these devices with not really, you know, all the early research is always done on animals so it can be applied to people, but it wasn't being used clinically for animals. So I had nobody like backing me up saying, here's what you do, but I just started using it and using it and using it. This particular device is FDA cleared for pain, anxiety, insomnia, and depression. And we treat not only the bad area, so like if you had a bad knee on the right, we treat the bad right knee. We also treat the left side because we know there's compensation. There's also messaging signals that go from left to right. And then we also, there's a part of it where you put clips on the ears and it runs a very, very low frequency, low waveform, broad waves that helps to normalize those firing patterns because those signals from the bad part of the body have been going to the brain the main the brain made decisions based on bad information now we have to work to integrate that back and this tool is phenomenal in being able to heal through nerves it's actually a stem cell stimulator i say this as a veterinarian not as from the company because they can only say what's on the cleared fda but when you read the research it actually is a stem cell stimulator it stimulates blastema the really early embryonic cells to go in production so where normally a back lesion is scar tissue gets in there because nerve cells run they, they heal too slowly this can actually stop that from happening we had a dog that came in he was a cardigan corgi had been had hemilaminectomy had been paralyzed for five years he's 10 years old this dog could get up and take one or two steps but he drug himself everywhere half of his life he'd been paralyzed so we started him with the alpha stem did the nutrient program within 90 days and the underwater treadmill this dog was walking he eventually got to where he could go up and down four or five stairs. He could chase the kids playing football. And he, he hadn't walked for five years. Five years. This dog had been paralyzed for five years. You'd he lived to be that. 16. Oh, wow. But you said he would take one or two steps so that you know that he didn't have complete nerve damage, right? That's right. There was something there. Yeah, yeah that was the thing. Yeah, so, and I said, well, there's something here he can do. And mm-hmm. I looked for muscle tone. Right. Like I'll put a little ball under him or a peanut or something that we can get him to stand, not a real peanut they're aired up balls mm. that are in the shape of a peanut keeps a dog from falling off the side so i'll get them up and find is there any tone to that muscle because if there's some tone then then we've got something to work with if they're totally flaccid weak like a noodle mm-hmm. limp, then there's you know not not going to be a chance but that's rare that i find that most of the time there's something there that we can work with so this uh, microcurrent mm-hmm. it, it kills bacteria it heals wounds i started using laser before the alpha stem and i still use a lot of laser too but laser you tend to treat one area it doesn't integrate everything like the alpha stem does it's really phenomenal um i want to ask you the uh, you have a program called fit Pause. Well, Fit Paws is actually a program that I became a master trainer to, and I okay. have another master trainer there. And so we based we had to go to Colorado. Fit Paws okay. is a, a licensed program, and we had to train on how they 
trained to exercise dogs. So it's actually teaching the dog the correct way to sit, the correct way to stand. It works on strengthening their core so their whole body will be strong. You know, you can't have a strong back if you got weak abdominal muscles right. and vice versa. So we work with that and it makes it fun because we do have different ways that they, different things they can play with, they play on. We've set up balls and ramps and uh, the so peanuts can, and balancing. You, so uh, I used to keep dachshunds. Mm-hmm. And of course, dachshunds are notorious, like a lot of other dogs, corgis and stuff, for having back problems. So could this be like a preventative health management kind of uh, core training that you give the owners to train the dogs mm-hmm. and hopefully minimize or mitigate the uh, the likelihood of a, of a disc event? Correct. Yeah, that's a part of it. It's And it we do private lessons, mostly some little groups, uh-huh. but where they, they get trained and they train the dog, and then they continue this throughout the lifetime. Yeah, and they can educate more, and it is starting that body early on so that it can be a strong body. And yeah. it's a great program. It's great a fun I- thing. Great idea, yeah. and it's a great... I got to tell you program. my other thing. You know, we were talking about before the show about how our brains get going, and sometimes you just would like it to turn off, but it doesn't. Right. So, you know... You're a funny guy. Sometimes I'm funny. I just came up with this Tai Chi Wawa. I was doing Tai Chi mm-hmm. myself. And, you know, I thought, oh, you know, Tai Chi Wawa. I should do this. You know, that would be funny, you know, yeah. and a fun thing. So I actually created this Tai Chi Wawa program, and it's taken Tai Chi moves. Uh-huh. And we do it with the dogs. There's an awakening program. There's awakening part of it where you're, like, when you're doing Tai Chi, you get in your stance. And then we have the moves. And they're all, all Tai Chi was designed over animal motion, uh-huh. and how they conserve all their energy until they need that leap. Right. They're not wasting it like I am here flailing with my arms, you know, right. wasted motion. So uh, so then we have the moves, and then there's a closing part of it. So I actually have a little a video of this oh, that I had filmed that. by a professional. Marilyn has it at home. She's supposed oh, to be doing them on Bruno. You know what? I saw it sitting there, and I wondered, <laughs> where does this come from? Yeah, and I realized so, it was from, yeah, she has part of his exercise program. So I have to uh, punish my wife, yeah. which is kind dun, of fun. Dun, anyway. dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No food for a week. Yeah. So. so we show doing it on uh, a young dog, a small dog. We have a chihuahua in there. We even do it on a cat. I have this guy, one guy that worked with me that had a rat that had a brain problem, and this rat loved having this done with him it helped wow. take the tension out of his yes that mess right. the rat what can you tell Wait, so, today? <laughs> so the point of doing the tai chi with the mm-hmm. animal is fill in the blank. balance balance uh-huh it is it's for balance uh, circulation mm-hmm. so as you get stiff and old your circulation not so good muscles are yeah so part of it is getting the nerves go into the tissue again mm-hmm. and then the other part of it is yeah very low impact Mm-hmm. exercise so if you have arthritic bodies if you have one that's had a, a, a some kind of a nerve injury and their balance is off it's really good for those is this Even like yoga young in ones humans and, yoga no in it's humans? tai chi yeah tai, i know tai, tai chi is a science but isn't no. yoga doing tai the same chi thing exercise. no, no yoga is totally different than tai chi just stretch i guess don't you see the dick van dyke commercials whatever they call that thing the movement sort of looks more like this you've yeah there's oh, no, see people I know. in a I park in california study tai chi, yeah. But, yeah but it's but it's different than yoga oh, okay mm-hmm. yeah no it's neat sort of in the same world yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna um search that out at home and and look at it's it. pretty fun i think you it's a like, great idea and the my the the um film production company that put it together she did a really good job megan hannigan digital productions is her company uh-huh. and she put music to the background and she picked out just the right music for each different breed there's a visla there's a german shepherd there's a hound dog there's a cat and a chihuahua and it's the music it's really cute okay so the point of of that ava was trying to make when she sent that home it's not that you would discover in the corner somewhere that you would actually do it so so not am I helping? Am I no, helping no, by it's not me. I, you know, the messenger didn't provide the message, so well, I know it's a how good to, thing. <laughs> it's a good I, thing that you were here today because she Ava. probably figured it would get reassigned to her anyway. Yeah, most things do. <laughs> yeah, most things do. We only have a minute or so left. Can you real quickly uh-huh. tell me what conditions you treat most often that I can share with my? Uh, Pet, I've got the dog and cat pets mostly. Uh-huh. So, I mean, can you, in two sentences, tell me what you think drives people to your office? Arthritis, mm-hmm. pain, inability to move, carrying a leg. Actually, we see a lot of cancer type of patients, but that's oh. a type of a pain too, you know, and we become the last hope. But uh, just helping those bodies feel better. Seizures, 
mm-hmm. things we can do with the alpha stem with the CES with seizures, and definitely the neurologic patients, dragging the feet, uh-huh. uh, can't get around, the bad backs, the sore necks, the screaming, and then the performance animals. Have you had a chance to work with like Dr. Rhett Winninger, the uh, traditional oh, neurologist? Sure. Mm-hmm. Does he understand and appreciate the services you provide? He does. He says that. Yeah, he does. And we work together with quite a few different ones. And they may do the surgery, and then we see them. Or it's ones that are going, it's going to cost you this much. And the people go, I can't afford that. I've sent people to you for that. Let's try something else. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to stop again, and we'll be back with our recap visit. And uh, it's been great. I'm really learning a lot. I hate to sound so stupid. And how to reach her. Yeah, well, yeah. I know how to reach her. I know, but She's pretty close right, to right across house. the table. Yeah. Yeah. Give me five, Doug. <laughs> there, it's good. I got her. <laughs> Dr. Doug Pernikoff, Dr. Ava Frick, and our wonderful, wonderful, feeling like a rag co-host, Cindy Vickers. We'll be right back. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. We're back at our recap session for Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And again, as I said earlier, I want to thank our special guest, Dr. Ava Frick of the Pet Rehab and Pain Clinic in Eureka. Ava, do you want to um, let people know again how to reach you? Certainly, that'd be great. Our phone number there in Eureka is 636-549-9100. And you can go to our website, which is animalrehabstlouis.com. Wonderful. And um, I think it was a great show and understanding a whole different approach to veterinary medicine. We could talk for days, and I'd love to have you back and talk about some of your special cases that okay, we can do that. have been a lot of fun for yeah. you. Uh-huh. And uh, always as a veterinarian, someone asked me today, what is the most disappointing part about being a veterinarian? And I said, it's when I fail somebody. Mm-hmm. And uh, that happens all the time because we're only human. But um I think you probably feel the same way. You add a whole new set of modalities to try and treat non-traditionally along with your traditional understanding of medicine. So I think it's great. So she offers physiotherapy. Is that part of the chiropractic science, the physiotherapy? No, actually, yeah, it's separate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all sorts of interesting technologies. She has an amazing... uh, nutrition a couple of different nutrition programs to look at so please if you have any questions talk to your vet most of them know everybody knows Ava and um, again in my clinic we share cases and do some of the traditional some of the non-traditional in order to help people and I think that the patients really appreciate having alternatives you know and you know we guide them one way she guides another way and we try and find the common ground when we can Cindy, did you want to say anything in particular? Well, I just have one little event I'd like to mention, um, which is sends you out a little closer to Ava's world. This is for the Franklin County Humane Society, and coming up September 30th, uh, Wine, Whiskers, and Wags. It's a fun. It's the, I think probably their big fundraiser of the year. September 30th, and registration begins at 4:30. They have a silent auction. They have a live auction. That will be big fun. Forty dollars a person, or you can get a table of ten for. A 375 save a little bit of money and of course all the proceeds go to help all the animals that they are trying to, desperately to take care of so do you know the location it's at robler i do robler vineyard and winery in new haven it's a little but bit you, west of washington there off of 100 oh, you can okay. call contact ron at 314-413-8260 so um, again, it's been a wonderful show. I just want to ask you: Have you ever had a chance to do an elephant? No, I haven't. You know, I worked with the one that they had at Six Flags uh-huh. years and years and years ago before I even got to vet school. Uh, when John Clark was working there as yeah. a supervisor there, yeah. Yeah. that was fun. But no, I, as far as like veterinary, no, I haven't been uh, able to do an elephant. They're wonderful animals to work yeah. with. But, um, in my world, lots of interesting critters mm-hmm. that probably could appreciate. Some they have of your a service. monkey. Oh, yeah. We worked we, on a monkey. I have lots of monkeys mm-hmm. I can send over there, including the one you're looking at right now. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely Come have some, on down. I've got some sciatica and some stuff that could use some help. And, uh, yeah, things I didn't know about. I have ruptured discs from football. I have spinal arthritis below, lower. Yeah, hey, you need that alpha stem. And I've got four cervical discs. Hey, hook extruded. you up, dude. Yeah, I may walk around. I go, uh, yeah, you should do it. Try it. I am going to try it. Yeah. What the heck? I've seen it. I've had it in my hands. So, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I know. It's fun. 
And uh, I just want to thank everybody again. It's been wonderful. Cindy, you're always wonderful. Thanks and, for the invite. Uh, thank yeah, you. No, I'll we'll definitely have you back again. Okay. Well, you can come back too, Doug. I will. I think All I right. will. Maybe okay. next week. <laughs> if you need to get a hold of Cindy for some training action, you can call the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic at 636-530-1808 and ask for Cindy. We'll connect you guys. Or if you need me, Dr. Doug Pernikoff, also at 636-530-1808, the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic in Chesterfield, Missouri. And I want to thank my audience. I want to thank Ava. I want to thank Cindy. And we'll be back next week with another exciting show.